Hello, my name is Cody Price, and I just want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 o'clock, so we'll begin our presentation shortly. Today, on June 17th, we'll have our presentation on planning for regional innovation clusters, given by um, Scott Demf Demoff, uh, Terry Holzheimer, and Sakina Khan. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we'll be able to answer those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of our participating chapters, divisions, and universities. And I just want to send a personal thank you out for the, um, the NCAC and the Economic Development Chapters for sponsoring today's session. Upcoming webcast, um, our next one will be on June 24th. Um, on the introduction to the H plus T affordability index and applications and planning. And then our next one will be in July on community erosion. And then we'll start with our August ones on August 5th on zoning stat. Um, and then on August 12th, fights over flight. And if any of these sound of interest to you or you want to see our complete listing, please go to www.utah-apa.org slash webcast and you can register for your webcast of choice. Um, today's session is already um, approved for one and a half CM credits, so to log your CM credits, you'll need to go to www.planning.org slash CM, select activities by date, and then underneath Friday, June 17th, you'll see planning for regional innovation clusters. And we are recording today's session, so um, afterwards you'll be able to go to www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive and you'll be able to find the video recording and a six slide per PDF, and this should be up by Monday. At this time, I'd now like to hand it over to Shanna Johnson, who will be introducing our speakers for today. Hello, my name is Shanna Johnson, and I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the APA Economic Development Division, one of the sponsors of today's webinar, in conjunction with the National Capital Area Chapter of the American Planning Association. I just wanted to take a moment to highlight the division for all of you. You can visit us at our website. Also, we have an active blog or tweet us anytime. And the division is always looking for volunteers. We're currently looking for a Los Angeles area planner to be our conference coordinator for the National Planning Conference for next year. So if you're interested in that or the topics you hear today and getting more involved with the division, I would encourage you to contact us via any one of the uh, methods provided on the slide that's currently showing. Uh, today we're privileged to have three uh, very distinguished speakers that work uh, in the field of economic development planning. Scott Dempwolf is a PhD student in planning at the University of Maryland. Uh, he's a certified economic developer and has worked previously for many years as a local economic development practitioner. He's currently working on his dissertation, which seeks to demonstrate that innovation networks play an important role in smaller industrial regions, and that by explicitly considering network approaches, federal economic development policy could become more effective and equitable. He's also the, paper of, uh, the, the author of several peer-reviewed papers. Uh, Terry Holzheimer has been the director of Arlington Economic Development in Arlington, Virginia since 2005, and has uh, been in uh, local economic development and planning for uh, many decades. <laughs> he has a PhD from George Mason University in public policy with a specialization in regional development and a bachelor's in economics from U University of Florida. He is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners College of Fellows and is also certified by the International Economic Development Council and serves on the, as an adjunct fund faculty at the Virginia Tech Urban Affairs and Planning Program in Alexandria, Virginia. Our third speaker today will be Sakina Khan, a senior economic planner at the, in the District of Columbia Office of Planning. Ms. Khan specializes in economic development analysis and strategy with a focus on emerging sectors. She's manager of uh, multiple high-level economic development and economic development planning initiatives within the District of Columbia. Uh, including the Creative DC Action Agenda, which sought to strengthen the district's creative economy through business, employment, educational, and neighborhood-based approaches, uh, and several other initiatives which target opportunities to 
increase creative green retail and technology sectors within the district and uh, also increase retail activity. Ms. Khan is a graduate of uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where she earned a degree, a master's degree in city planning. And with uh, that, I will go ahead and give it to you, Scott, to begin our presentation. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, my task today is to take you through the, the introduction to regional innovation clusters. And um, so we're going to start with, uh, with a definition of clusters. And um, uh, it's more than just a supply chain. A uh, cluster is a geographically proximate group of interconnected companies, um, which is what a supply chain generally is. Um, but it also, a cluster includes associated institutions in a particular field um, linked by commonalities and, and complementarities. And there's a, a process by which um, uh, clusters emerge. And this graphic down here at the bottom of the, of the slide um, was developed by Ed Morrison, uh, somebody who I, I read uh, frequently. And I would commend him to all of you to uh, check out his blog. Um, and it starts with a, a conversation among businesses um, and networks begin to form. And then out of those networks, um, uh, people say we ought to get together and, and you know engage the universities and and so forth, and so a strategic agenda emerges, um, and then they really begin to to make investments that uh, go beyond the boundaries of individual firms and institutions, but affect the uh, the, the entire cluster, and from there it just uh, continues to roll. So why do we care about clusters? Um, and this is a, a kind of a tongue-in-cheek slide that I, I use with my uh, graduate students. Um, and we care about clusters uh, because practitioners love them, but most don't really understand them. And uh, this was a big problem in the, the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. We had a lot of cluster initiatives that, that started and failed, uh, many of them in biotech because people really didn't understand the, the basics of, of clusters. Uh, there were enterprising authors uh, who promoted them and uh, uh, to practitioners who loved them but really didn't understand them. Uh, but now the, the big reason we care about clusters is that federal economic development policy has made a major shift in that direction. Um, uh, and of course, they are a useful way of understanding the economic relationships in your region. Um, but clusters didn't just start in the 90s. It, um, uh, we got the definition of clusters uh, in the 90s from uh, Michael Porter, uh, who is the name most associated with, with the concept of clusters. But in fact, um, uh, the work on um, uh, the precedence for clusters uh, industrial districts, industrial complexes, um, uh, agglomeration theory goes back a hundred years before Porter. So, um, so there's a, a long and and deep history behind clusters. Um, they're not a, a new concept at all. So the definition on the left there um, for industry clusters is the one that I had on the on the first slide. Um, we're now shifting into um, an era that is uh, being influenced by the uh, new growth theory, evolutionary economics, um, uh, economic geography terms, um, but there's a, a school of economists out there that uh, are really beginning to influence the way we, we look at the concept of agglomeration and um, and where businesses locate. Um, so now we're moving into this, this notion of regional innovation clusters. And you can see the definition is pretty similar, um, uh, except that there's more emphasis on the, 
uh, on the institutions. So what really is new um, with these regional innovation clusters? Uh, geography still matters, uh, but it's now specified instead of just proximity as a, as a vague term. We have regional as a mm, equally vague term. Um, we have uh, the interconnections are still central, but there's a greater emphasis on the, the associated institutions and sources of innovation. Um, We've been hearing an awful lot about innovation in the media lately. Um, uh, there's good reason for that, and we'll talk about that uh, shortly. Um, and then finally, the, the linkages um, are being emphasized much more in regional innovation clusters. Um, you could have a, a group of associated uh, or firms in the same uh, industry group um, same sectors. You could have an, uh, a number of firms all be in the same uh, location, the same county. That doesn't make them a cluster. It's the relationships that really make them a cluster. And so um, here's just uh, one uh, kind of network example um, from York County, Pennsylvania that just looks at the, uh, the top level uh, industries and occupational groups involved in the snack food cluster. And York County is the home of uh, Utz potato chips and Snyder's pretzels and all kinds of uh, yummy and fattening uh, snack foods. So um, uh, there's a, a lot going on there. Um, but one of the things that intrigued me when I when I ran this cluster was that um, uh, Plastic bottles uh, came up as a, it's, it's up here in the upper left-hand corner, um, plastic bottle manufacturing came up as part of the snack food cluster. And I, I couldn't figure that out for the longest time. And uh, one day I was in the grocery store, and lo and behold, and on the, the end of the aisle, I see these big plastic jugs filled with pretzels and cheese balls and, and all kinds of things uh, made by Utz. Uh, some made by Schneiders, and um, and it dawned on me that that was uh, that was the connection. So uh, sometimes you, the association between the clusters is not uh, immediately apparent. Okay, so why do clusters form? Um, we're going to go back to agglomeration theory, and this is a not an easy subject. To, uh, to explain, and certainly not an easy subject to explain in, in, uh, in about a minute or two, but I'm going to give it a try. There are three um, economies, if you will, uh, associated with agglomeration. The first is the common economies of scale, um, which basically says that the more we make, the less each unit costs. Um, it's why you have big utilities. Uh, that. Uh, uh, so that each kilowatt hour that, of electricity that they generate costs less. Um, then there are urbanization economies. Uh, when you think of um, big cities, what you find there is the variety. There are things that you can get in, in New York City that you can't get anywhere else. Um, uh, so the bigger places have more variety. That's urbanization economies. And then you have localization economies, which is that similar firms benefit from locating together. They, um, uh, they draw on common labor pools. Um, they may draw customers. Uh, it, it's one of the reasons why you see um, uh, McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's uh, located at, at the same intersection um, rather than being spaced out. Um, so those are the three agglomeration principles. Um, so let's interpret those in terms of the factors uh, that come into play for cluster formation. Um, and there are three that Porter identified. Uh, one is intense price competition. And when you have fierce competition, that drives prices down. Uh, the second is uh, the level of transport costs, and if you have low transport costs, 
that tends to limit the advantages that um, uh, that any particular place has because of its um, uh, its unique amenities, or because of the port, or because it has uh, raw materials, um, because you can transport things uh, inexpensively. Uh, and then you have localization economies, which is the, again, similar firms benefiting from locating together. So then there's also an effect uh, that comes into play with globalization. Uh, Porter noted this in, um, uh, in 1998, um, and he talked about it being a paradox that um, the competitive advantages in a global economy lie in uh, local things. Um, it really is, um, uh, is not a big mystery, um, but the, I think the mystery helps sell the books. So uh, let me break that down for you. Um, global trade is one of the things that's driving this, this push towards localization, towards regionalization. Um, globalization results from uh, a number of improvements in technology, better communications, better inventory control systems uh, uh, like barcodes, uh, better logistics systems, uh, and a coordinated cap, uh, capital market. Uh, Tom Friedman wrote a book in 2000, I think, um, The Lexus and the Olive Tree. Uh, great read. And it's really what he um, what he talks about in uh, uh, in that book. Um, globalization results in the fierce price competition that uh, we noted as being one of the, the drivers of clustering. It results in lower transport costs, um, which is the second uh, factor in cluster formation, and so when you throw in the, the localization economies, that's what's really driving the, the um, uh, shift towards regional clusters. And now just a, a quick look at the evolution of competitive advantage, which is the perspective that Porter approaches this from. Uh, there are many different scholars that are working on clusters, but um, uh, and they, they focus on different aspects, but Porter really talked about it from the competitive advantage standpoint. So um, traditional comparative advantage, which is, are the things that most traditional economic development programs focus on, really look at the traditional factors of production, land, labor, and capital. What we're seeing now is a shift towards the technological change factors, and that's innovation and entrepreneurship that lead to increased productivity, new products, um, and the types of things that are the focus of technology-led economic development programs. Um, identifying clusters is a, is a whole course in itself, um, uh, but there are several uh, uh, methods and measures that we use, the most common being location quotients, um, which is a measure of the, the spatial concentration of uh, same industry firms. Um, there is a the shift share analysis, which breaks down the, the change in, in a measure like employment, breaks that down between how much is part of the, the overall national economy, how much is due to the particular industry that you're looking at, and how much is due to some uh, local factors. Um, and then you have some, some more advanced methods, uh, uh, input-output analysis, uh, and social network analysis, uh, which is the area that I'm working in, um, that really begin to look at what the connection between industries and between industries and occupations. So I have a couple examples. Um, real quick, this is uh, the construction cluster in Prince George's County, Maryland. Uh, this was done by one of my grad students last, um, last semester. And um, you can see that the, uh, uh, there's a, a large cluster of, of construction firms uh, and related businesses in Prince George's County. Um, 
you can see the large blue uh, circle up at the top, building equipment contractors, um, uh, employs almost 12,000 people uh, with a location quotient of 2.87. What that means is that that industry is, um, is almost three times as dense in Prince George's County as it is in uh, the average uh, county throughout America. Um, and here's a real good example. Uh, I, I would recommend that you go take a look at it. Um, the, uh, the web address is there on, on the page. Um, this is a new uh, cluster analysis report just out by the North Central Kansas um, folks. Uh, they're, they're doing a lot of really innovative and interesting stuff out in Kansas, so I'd, I'd really commend you to, to, to go take a look at this. But the, if you look down at the bottom, there's a map of Kansas and the North Central region. And then if you look at the, um, the image, what they've done is map out their clusters uh, by county. So that's each one of these is a county. Um, and the extent of the, of the little, the colored uh, wedges, the further out they are, the higher their location quotient. So you can begin to see that, um, uh, so for example, this um, uh, looks like uh, machinery is pretty strong in a lot of different places. And so it's, it's a very quick, very visual way to look at your region, which in this case is, is uh, about a dozen counties, and, um, and get a quick sense of, of what's going on there. So um, great study. I'd, I'd recommend it. Here's one more is an example of uh, uh, some of the things that I'm working on. Um, this takes uh, SBIR and STTR data. SBR stands for Small Business Innovation Research. And these are innovation grants that go to companies to um, uh, to do research for, um, and commercialization of products. So the red circles are companies uh, that have received these, um, uh, these grants. And there's a, a minimum threshold on this graphic of, of $1 million. So um, every red circle on here has received at least $1 million. And the larger the circle, the more they've received. So, um, so what you see over here on the right-hand side is that this blue triangle is HHS, Health and Human Services. And this green triangle is Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, which is just uh, northwest of Washington, D.C. And it's where the um, Bethesda is located, where the um, National Institutes of Health uh, and a large number of, of other uh, health-related uh, businesses and, and institutions are located. And you can see a large cluster of, of uh, health-related uh, things there. Uh, this other blue, large blue wedge is, is Department of Defense. And you can see they're um, related here to Anne Arundel County, Prince George's County. Uh, here's NASA, uh, which has Goddard Space um, Center in Prince George's County, Howard County. Um, so you can, can begin to see the location of firms and uh, and the types of research that uh, that they're doing, and that will be a, an important uh, factor in in looking at innovation clusters. Um, and then here's uh, one more slide on your county. Um, this is a, a fairly new method that maps um, industries, which are the green circles, with occupational clusters. So, um, uh, so let me pick one that's out, out here where, where there's not a lot of uh, uh, things bunched together. Here's the construction occupational cluster. You have a number of different types of, of, uh, of contractors, uh, residential, um, commercial, uh, 
uh, institutional and so forth. Um, you have architectural firms out here. You have an architectural and engineering um, uh, occupation cluster up here. Um, so there's uh, here's uh, maintenance and um, uh, maintenance of buildings and so forth. So um, this is again a very quick way to uh, to visualize the the local economy, the numbers that are associated with this. Uh, for example, um, here's uh, 1244. Um, that means that there are 1244 uh, employees from the architectural occupational cluster employed in the architectural industry uh, in York County. Uh, the green ones are um, uh, dollar volumes of trade between different industries. So that's it. Those are my examples. Um, I'm ready to hand this off to uh, uh, to, um, uh, to Sakina, no, to Terry. And um, uh, if you want more, you can email me. Um, we're also doing some short courses in, in August on this, which will be two full days of, of cluster analysis uh, in uh, Shady Grove, Maryland. So if you want to do that, um, there's a place to sign up. Thank you. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, I'm Terry Holsheimer. I'm Director of Economic Development in Arlington, Virginia. Um, been, as, as Shannon said, an economic development uh, guy for 40 years. Uh, so, so I'm trying to answer the question of if you have all this wonderful theory, what do you do with it? Um, and how do you use it uh, in a local economic development context? Uh, I'm talking a little bit about creating an innovation cluster from scratch. I'm not so sure we have a cluster yet, and I'm pretty sure we don't have a regional cluster yet in Homeland Security, but we're patching something together, and it's starting to, to come together a little bit. Um, from, from Arlington's standpoint, uh, the world changed 10 years ago. Uh, it, was, it was dramatic. Uh, it was uh, direct in terms of, of affecting us uh, in Arlington County, uh, and it changed the culture that we have here as it relates to security uh, in, in very dramatic ways. Um, we almost lost an airport. This is a national airport that uh, was closed as a result of the 9-11 uh, events at the Pentagon. Uh, all the airports in the country were closed for a few days. Uh, but there were so, uh, forces within the security agencies in uh, Washington that did not want to allow National Airport to be reopened, uh, given that it is within seconds of the, uh, uh, of the White House and, and Capitol Hill. And so we had to spend a lot of time and effort being able to um, make arguments for reopening the airport economic arguments, practical arguments, but then also we had to uh, provide uh, levels of security that were unknown beforehand in order to be able to justify keeping the airport open. Um, these are the ubiquitous Jersey barriers that, that people see everywhere, um, but those were important to us because we did not want them uh, littering our, our landscape. And we have a lot of federal agencies and a lot of federal contractors in the county and their first reaction uh, from a security standpoint was to want to put Jersey barriers around all of their facilities. Um, and so we became uh, engaged in security uh, discussions and risk assessment and analysis m uh, much more quickly than, than we might otherwise have. But also, we weren't experts in this stuff. We didn't know um, all of the and and other kinds of elements of security from a physical environmental standpoint. Um, we learned, we learned very quickly, we learned that, that there is a document, or there soon became a document, um, called the Unified Facilities Criteria, the Minimum Anti-Terrorism Standards for Buildings, um, that was uh, going to be applied to Department of Defense assets. 
Uh, in this case, it was related to the Defense Department because the uh, other group that was uh, representing everybody else in the government was trying to develop another set of standards. But the anti-terrorism standards were um, were rather uh, uh, draconian, uh, requiring substantial setbacks, building har uh, hardening. It was uh, uh, something that was not going to work in an urban environment. And we did a very quick analysis of the uh, 380 office buildings we have in the county, how many of them uh, met the standards, and the answer were zero, including the Pentagon. Um, and so the uh, Homeland Security, from a physical development uh, perspective, became really paramount in, in our minds, in our community. And then there was a, a decision made by um, Secretary Rumsfeld that uh, any space that, that was occupied by the Department of Defense uh, that was not on a military base was by definition um, insecure. Uh, and he uh, presided over the last round of base closure and realignment, BRAC as we call it, and in May 2005, uh, decided to close all of the military uh, offices that were located in Arlington that were not on military bases. Uh, there were 56 different BRAC actions in Arlington. Uh, it affected us at the equivalent of five military bases. Um, 17,000 DOD employees would be leaving the community. Uh, and so that was an economic development crisis for us from an from a economic base standpoint. Um, so we, we developed a little task force and said, well, okay, this is, this is we always described it as serious but manageable, but, but how, how are we going to manage it and what are we going to do about it? And so we came up with some uh, strategies and steps on how we can make the community more secure, how we can think about security differently, um, but also what do we need to do in the short term to deal with the loss of 17,000 jobs uh, within our community. Uh, so we did take some steps. One of the things that we did as part of the BRAC action was we were able to argue that some of the defense assets uh, uh, that we had in the county uh, needed to remain uh, because there were reasons for them being together. For instance, the, Department, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, the group who gave you the internet and stealth technology and working with ONR, the global positioning systems, things that we look at as fairly common today, um, uh, was in a building that didn't meet the uh, force protection standards. N neither did the uh, Air Force Office of Scientific uh, Research or the Office of Naval Research. But they were all located within a couple blocks of each other. And all the contractors that worked for these agencies were located within those few blocks. So uh, I suppose we had a bit of a of a scientific research cluster associated with defense already here by the by 9/11, uh, and many of them turned their uh, directions towards homeland security-related applications of defense technology, but none of them had buildings that were um, that met the standards. And so, one of the first things we did was we we got the agencies off the list, uh, the BRAC list, because we made a, a case that they're they are currently clustered, and that cluster represents this kind of dense uh, array of uh, interrelationships and networks that Scott was talking about. Uh, but we had to get them into secure space. So we actually worked with the state and, uh, and our uh, partners in a new building for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is the building on the right. Uh, hard to believe um, when you look at the picture of it or the, the rendering of it, and it's topped out and will be finished this year. Um, that it is the most hardened, force-protected building in urban America. Um, but because it doesn't look like it. It looks like it fits in an urban environment. And that's the point that we've been making, that security is not antithetical to urbanism or to density or to high-quality urban spaces. Uh, a soapbox we stand on every day. So then we worked with a, a researcher out of Virginia Tech, Heike Meyer, uh, on uh, the, the whole idea of how do we really create a technology-driven environment uh, and somehow foster these uh, emerging technology sectors of which Homeland Security appeared to be one. 
uh, we made a mistake uh, on this. We we started chasing the technologies, and we brought together um, you know several dozen people around different technologies, saying what's the future of this technology or that. And what we found out is that was irrelevant. What was really relevant was how the technologies knitted together in some way uh, around a niche. Uh, around a uh, subsector. Even the industrial classifications are irrelevant when it comes to, to most of this because they don't exist or barely exist in some cases. Um, so we came up with the, you know, a very simple little little chart, but it's, it's useful in its own way. Some of the technologies we were looking at were nanotech, IT, uh, distance learning, uh, wireless uh, applications, you have to remember the, the iPhone and BlackBerry hadn't been uh, developed at this point, really, and other kinds of Internet-related technologies. Well, they can all be applied to Homeland Security, and that was the, the point of this, uh, this graphic, is that we can find applications for technology and then use a variety of, of technologies around individual applications. Well, by 2005, it, we started to have a homeland security industry, because we now had a Department of Homeland Security, uh, which in 2001 we did not have. Uh, and, to th and, the, and the department had all these assets scattered all over the Washington metropolitan area and elsewhere around the country. Uh, so the question is, did, did, was this really an industry and was it really a cluster? And what can we do? Um, to build on the homeland security industry as it is developing uh, in Arlington to help create jobs and develop our own economy. So some of the data, you can look at the uh, DHS spending increased really dramatically from 2001 through, through 2004. It's probably stabilized you know, pretty much where it is. Uh, but this uh, looked at how the Washington area basically gets uh, you know, pretty close to half of uh, DHS spending, uh, and and so the area itself, the region itself, uh, receives a fair amount of uh, support from that federal government in building a cluster. You look at the distribution of the expenditures, and you can see that, uh, you know, from my my parochial perspective of Arlington, it was almost, uh, you know, nothing in uh, 2001. Um, and then uh, continue to grow uh, year by year, and uh, you know it's it's in the it's in the billion dollar a year range now. Um, it's been a little uneven. The district has been up and down in terms of uh, homeland security spending, but this is within the Washington region. Uh, but but homeland uh, security spending continued to grow and create this industry and potentially a cluster. High tech procurement and homeland security grew as well, and you can see that became Arlington specialization, where more dollars were spent on high tech procurement related to the homeland security industry in in my community than anywhere else in the region. And so, looking at our contractors, um, you know, we had a number of uh, systems integration companies. Their names that are particularly associated with uh, with the defense industry. Um, but the applications for homeland security are not dramatically different than uh, homeland than than defense. Uh, basically, it's all focused around uh, protection. Uh, so some of it is hardening, but other of it is uh, is actual protection. Uh, some of it is detection, and I think more work has gone into detection and detection devices than than any other aspect, and then response. So Arlington kind of built our own culture and our own uh, specialization around this protection, detection, response paradigm, uh, figuring we can do all three of those better than anybody else. Uh, and therefore, that was the basis of us uh, saying that Homeland Security is, in fact, a, uh, um, a sector for us to, to take a look at, uh, and as a cluster. And the assets that we have, basically the largest one is the transportation administration, customs is here, U.S. Visit, which is the immigration offices in our community. So there's a number of assets here, including a, a series of research assets, especially in cybersecurity, um, that are actual pieces of the Department of Homeland Security. But the Department of Homeland Security is still scattered all over the Washington landscape. Um, 
So our, our little model is a little overly simplistic, but it said, let's pull government, industry, and the universities together and, and create these kinds of networks or linkages between the three. We will use um, some components of a strategy that were, um, you know, fairly typical looking at uh, entrepreneurship. The big one for me was this using the county as a test bed or a pilot for emerging technology, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, being able to provide information on these micro sectors or niches became important. What are the specializations if we know more about them than anybody else does? We're more likely to be able to capitalize on that serve as a, so, a focal point for local tax policy and federal policy making because everything that happened in Homeland Security uh, happened at a magnified level in Arlington. Public policy was extraordinarily important to us. And then under, make sure that the, that the, the cultures that spread locally uh, in terms of having a culture of Homeland Security or security and then uh, building workforce programs around this growing industry, and then continue what we would otherwise do. But the whole idea of that we would do it through partnerships and alliances, branding and marketing, and building intelligence was the actionable part of, of the whole thing. So here's the components of a strategy, entrepreneurship. We can convene meetings, and that has been something that we have used pretty effectively uh, in terms of being able to, to say, to bring people together, to start to create these networks, to, to, to start to create um, uh, connectivity between various groups uh, that may or may not work together, but they, they may end up working together. When we looked at federal contracts among different agencies, not only Homeland Security, we found this kind of dense web of networks where nobody was a DARPA contractor. They worked for 10 or 15 different uh, federal agencies uh, around their specialized knowledge. Uh, and so we already started to have this kind of basis of a, of a, of a network. But by convening meetings about specific topics, uh, we were able to bring people together and introduce them and build our own um, uh, network uh, of, of all the people in the industry. And by being able to provide them useful information, uh, we became value to them. Um, talk a little bit about our strategy. Uh, business intelligence, partnerships and alliances, and branding and marketing. You know, this is the bread and butter of what economic developers do. Um, business intelligence, you can't really have anything that's credible unless you can prove that it's credible um, through some kind of analysis. And so a couple of the background studies that we did, we did one on brain power, we called it brain power, um, and looked at the physical and social science research industries and occupations in in the community and in the region. And we were able to better understand um, you know, who lives here, where do they work, um, how the education, uh, educated elite, if you will, uh, really are both uh, resident and employed in the county, and what are they doing here. So that was an important analysis for us to do. Uh, Arlington has, I think, the the highest the education level, one of the highest in the country with large numbers. I think close to 70 percent of our adults have college degrees now. Um, and then we looked at the security industry, homeland security industry in specifics. And in terms of partnerships and alliances, well, you know, if you, if you have to do something, well, then you kind of do what you can. And so we have kind of pulled each of these threads as we could. Uh, we ended up uh, forming a partnership with the uh, Department of Homeland Security with, uh, with uh, Science and Technology to uh, be the test bed for rapid visual uh, screening and assess risk assessment tool. In other words, how can they do a risk assessment very, very quickly uh, within a building, within an area, uh, within certain types of structures? They wanted to look at tunnels, and they wanted to look at transportation facilities, commercial facilities, office buildings. Um, and they had a whole array of different types uh, or pieces of infrastructure uh, that they had to be able to screen and assess risk on very, very quickly. So we actually loaned them or participated with them with our uh, inspection services division, the people who do building inspections and plans review, to be able to work with them on their tools. And we were the 
I guess you would call us the, the alpha test for some of these tools uh, and help them literally develop, uh, uh, develop the tools that they are releasing beginning um, tomorrow uh, nationally, uh, having done some beta tests in New York. We formed a group with Virginia Tech and IBM called the Center for Community Resilience and Security. It's a research center, um, but, but our hopes are that there will be a fair amount of uh, commercializable, if that's a word, uh, research that is done uh, within the center. One of the first projects we kind of helped fund uh, is something called Yellow Button, where they are able to uh, basically uh, make the presumption that everybody who has a BlackBerry or an iPhone uh, effectively is a sensor when we talk about the ability to, to uh, detect threats. Uh, and so as, if everybody is a sensor and they have an ability to report things uh, under whatever circumstances, whether it's audio or visual or video or, or whatever, they can then report things to someone who can analyze it and use the, use the data. Um, Yellow Button right now is, is engaged in various kinds of transportation. Uh, related applications, but I think the overall thought for, for the Center for Community Resilience and Security was the test that was done during the presidential inauguration uh, where they were able to take data, unformatted data, or data that's formatted in a, a jillion different ways, whether it was police band, radio, visual uh, video from, from the, the news media, uh, iPhone photos that were being flown around, emails, tweets, whatever, uh, that were by and large uh, geocoded and basically say, be able to analyze it very quickly, mash all this information and say, here's what's happening literally in every place around the region uh, in real time. Uh, and so as a, as a modeling exercise, that was an opportunity to say, okay, we really can take disparate data and make some sense of it and then get the information out to people who needed all of it but had only bits and pieces of it. So there's a lot of Homeland Security related potential with this, this center. Uh, and Arlington is officially the test bed for all of the technology that comes out of it. And we had another um, uh, partnership with the Pentagon Force Protection Agency looking at uh, detection devices. And because we control uh, the rooftops of all the buildings in the county, we were able to uh, deploy some detection devices and, and, make, uh, and do some testing determination in terms of what threats might be there, how quickly they can be detected, and how quickly they can be, um, the information can be used in some type of a response format. And then in order to, to partly brand, but partly, again, uh, bring a network together, uh, form the Boston Science and Technology Alliance. It's a, it's a discussion about science that happens right now through a Cafe Scientifique, which is, is just once a month, but we'll be doing it more frequently pretty soon. Uh, when the Virginia Tech Research Center officially opens next week. Uh, but the Science and Technology Alliance is open to everybody in the community on a monthly discussion about science. And it has proven to be uh, incredibly useful at building a culture of science uh, within uh, the Boston neighborhood here in Arlington. And so uh, this is a, an example of the tool that is going to be released tomorrow, but a handbook for rapid visual screening of buildings to evaluate terrorism risks done in conjunction with Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it's got a FEMA name on it because this was the, uh, I guess, the predecessor to the one that's, that's about to be released. But um, the FEMA group was incorporated within the Department of Homeland Security, and now they are DHS. So what, are you, what if you do all these great things and you don't tell anybody about it? Well, we have a, an, a uh, reason to tell people about it. We, we've come up with a, with a marketing scheme and branding scheme. We brand ourselves as a brain power community, um, diversity, innovation, science, research, technology, location. You know, m many, many communities have similar kinds of attributes. And, and how do you kind of distinguish yourself? And we've tried to do that um, through very focused communications about the um, niches that we have and the uh, specializations we have locally. And, and so I think we do what every good economic development agency does, which is get your message out and try to make sure it's a coherent message that has credibility uh, for your community. And we've been pretty successful with that. 
So that's speaking as a local economic developer. I know Shakina is, is, uh, works in local economic development or local government as well. And our ability to work together across the region is something we are now all investigating. It is not quite where it needs to be, uh, I guess, to be really a, neat, a regional innovation cluster. But as we start knitting together the assets of the different communities that already have networks within them into networks between them and among them, we may actually end up with a regional innovation cluster uh, in the not too distant future. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Shakina uh, right now, and she'll uh, she'll take us home here. Okay, Shakina. Okay, great. Thanks, Terry. Let me just get this started. Hi everyone, my name is Sakina Khan and um, I'm the Senior Economic Planner with the DC Office of Planning and um, as Terry said, uh, uh, there is an effort underway um, within the district as well as the region um, to really focus on how, how, be how best to leverage uh, the Homeland Security um, cluster uh, within this region. So I'm going to be talking about this um, really more focusing more on the, the kind of the planning and analysis that, that is currently underway in the district and also um, touching on the, the community and, and, and place-based implications of an innovation strategy. So um, the area that, that we're looking at on this screen is uh, to the right here is the District of Columbia and the Department of Homeland Security is currently spread across the region in about 40 different locations and it is going to be consolidating down to about 10 or 12 locations with its headquarters right here in this red box uh, uh, which is the Congress Heights neighborhood in Ward 8 and specifically DHS is going to have its headquarters on the west campus of the St. Elizabeth's um, site which is the site of the, the former mental hospital. Just to give you some context this area uh, east of the river, this is Ward 8 and Ward 7 is, is adjacent to this area, um, is, a, is an area that has been um, historically disinvested in and with the consequence that um, this area has some of the highest rates of unemployment, poverty, um, illiteracy, not just within the city but within the region as a whole. So we have a number of um, planning challenges that, that we are trying to address as we figure out how best to, to leverage the consolidation. But the economic environment overall um, east of the river is starting to change and there have been significant investments in infrastructure, housing, uh, commercial, uh, totaling more than four billion dollars and some of those big projects are shown here uh, there's a major housing project going on at Berry Farms, there'll be a major mixed use project at Poplar Point. So the economic landscape um, is starting to change and, and together with the consolidation of, of DHS there's a real uh, opportunity to create a significant new economic center in the district. I'm trying to forward through this. Okay, so um, the challenge for the district um, or, or the opportunity is how do we take this large-scale project and really use it as a catalyst for broad community and economic revitalization. So in other words, how do you take a $3.6 billion federal investment uh, that brings 14,000 employees and about 2,000 daily visitors and positively support revitalized neighborhoods where the unemployment rate is around 33 percent and where 47 percent of children live in, live in poverty. So for planners this is really a fundamental question about how do we avoid uh, creating additional inequality and dislocation and how do we really best connect a distressed community to a high value cluster. This, um, this is kind of what we're most afraid of which is um, a level five uh, security a federal agency that requires level five security trained a wall or a moat and they're being um, kind of a walled off federal agency with no real connections uh, to the surrounding community. So we're trying to undertake um, principled redevelopment and planning to avoid that and to really promote um, 
uh, kind of holistic revitalization that would result in healthy and safe neighborhoods, high quality housing, diverse retail and businesses, education and job training opportunities, as well as um, uh, transportation, uh, accessible transportation. So there's really this exchange between um, in terms of people, goods, and ideas between what is going to be happening on the west campus of St. Elizabeth's, uh, where DHS is located, and the east campus of, of St. Elizabeth's. So there's, there's a, a few principles that we're pursuing um, as we undertake redevelopment of the east campus, which is, which is under the district's control. Um, and those principles are really interrelated, and it's about bringing the physical planning together with the transportation infrastructure planning, uh, together with the economic development planning. And the, the, the economic development planning right now is really focused on um, this innovation strategy. And as part of this, um, we are engaging with the community, and there's also a lot of federal coordination, as you can imagine, uh, with, with uh, the Department of Homeland Security and other federal agencies. So the strategy that we're undertaking um, is really about stimulating economic and, and community development and promoting that range of economic opportunities in terms of entrepreneurship, incubation, workforce development, and education. And we're being very intentional from the outset about trying to link residents and local businesses to those opportunities. And so um, we're doing this by developing and, and hopefully implementing an innovation strategy that's being led by district government but with a lot of collaboration with both district and federal agencies, input from industry experts, as well as from stakeholders. And we're supported uh, with a, by a federal grant in doing this, and um, the research is being led by Dr. Heike Meyer, who also did the Arlington um, research that Terry was talking about from Virginia Tech, and also um, Dr. Christina Gabriel from Carnegie Mellon. And um, this is really being done in tandem with a regional innovation um, uh, strategy that Dr. Christina Gabriel is also leading. So in terms of the, the actual place um, that we're looking to um, kind of be an anchor for innovation, this is a slide that shows the, um, the east campus of St. Elizabeth's, which is under district control, like I mentioned. And um, this is about 170 acres. And it includes both um, historic buildings. There are actually two distinct campuses already existing um, on the site as well as significant capacity for new development. And um, there is a metro stop that you see here um, at the bottom of the screen. So in terms of kind of some of the principles of planning, we do hope to leverage that metro stop and to undertake transit-oriented development, as well as apply green and, and sustainable um, building practices to what will hopefully be a significant mixed-use development with um, residential office, retail, and institutional uses and that also comprise um, an innovation hub. The, um, just to give you an idea of the actual approach that we're undertaking, in some ways this is a fairly conventional approach to cluster analysis in the sense that we're conducting a competitive positioning assessment of the district vis-a-vis um, -vis the homeland security economy. We're looking at metrics such as employment and procurement um, and some of the assets that we have, and we're also conducting a best practices assessment that helps us understand what does it really take to create a locally or regionally embedded innovation cluster that leverages a, a federal agency. And then we're going to be determining um, the specific programmatic approaches that are most appropriate for, um, for this hub and developing an innovation strategy. However, our approach may be somewhat different from, from how other clusters have been analyzed in the sense that we really um, do need to develop robust strategies that connect an economically distressed neighborhood or an emerging neighborhood, as, as, as we like to term it, um, to, to this high-value cluster without creating further dislocation. And so, like I said, we're being very intentional about, uh, from the outset, about figuring out what those strategies um, could be. We're also having to work um, in lockstep fashion with a master planning effort that is underway for the East Campus so that the vision for an innovation hub um, can be facilitated and implemented um, at the physical development level with the supporting planning framework and infrastructure. And those are the, um, the strategies that I mentioned. So um, one of the early tasks that we're doing is, is defining the Homeland Security Cluster. And um, you know this kind of goes back to, to both what Scott and Terry were talking about in terms of really understanding um, the cluster, the backward and forward linkages, and for us, we need to understand how um, DHS acts as both a major employer, 
as an, 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 a purchaser, as well as an innovator, a standard setter, a policy maker, and some of those key buckets um, or those key relationships um, relate to DHS being at the kind of the center of this cluster and its links to the large defense contractors, the innovative firms, the SBIR, SBIR firms that, that, um, that Scott had mentioned, the small businesses, the technology users, service firms, other federal agencies and, and research organizations. And that's in addition to really understanding how DHS operates within the agency, which is also fairly complex. We're also screening this from, um, from a policy perspective so that we can make sure um, that we make those connections um, to the community. So in terms of business development, we're, we are looking at um, DHS procurement. It's large. It's currently around $14 billion. And understanding kind of where the district's competitive position is with respect to that, with a view to helping DC firms and entrepreneurs uh, get access to that economy and kind of benefit from it and grow the Homeland Security industry in the district. In terms of workforce development, we know that 14,000 jobs are being um, relocated to the headquarters site at St. Elizabeth's. And so as part of what we're doing in our analysis and planning is figuring out how we can better connect DC residents to those jobs through um, career pathway training and, and, and workforce training. Um, in terms of education and research, there are at least um, 300 security related programs um, around the country and, and, and we're looking for how, you know, what kind of niche could, um, could education, could the district have in terms of education given the proximity of the East Campus to the West Campus, is, are, are there helpful programs that could be in place that could um, connect the community to DHS and also DHS to its, to its wide set of partners. The commercialization piece is also interesting. Um, DHS is is one of the few federal agencies that consumes its own technology and it actually is the only agency I think that has its own chief commercialization officer. So there's a very, um, there's a much shorter window in terms of product development and testing and evaluation and, and commercialization um, that, that we could leverage perhaps on, on the East Campus and, and we're looking at how we might do that uh, through kind of incubation facilities, etc. And then in terms of real estate and, and support infrastructure, the context that we're working under is this uh, unique campus-like setting on, on the East Campus and really needing to understand what are the types of um, infrastructure investments and facilities that we need to, um, to, to develop in order to really support an, an innovation hub, knowing that uh, any full, fully fledged innovation hub takes a very long time to, to develop uh, in, in order for it to be kind of successful and, and robust. And we're also looking at other strategies um, including housing, a, a live near your work strategy. So just in terms of some of the, um, the outcomes and example actions that, that we're considering in terms, and, and this is kind of where we get down to very specific place-based planning, um, which really uh, links up with the master planning effort that, that's underway so that we can be in sync. Um, but in terms of business development, uh, we're thinking about a small business one-stop incubator, um, commercialization facilities, the demonstration center. Uh, we're looking into um, really having a critical mass of DHS contractors be in, proximate, be in proximity to, to the West Campus and thinking about the different types of um, office options that are available today and that, are, and, and that, and that uh, workers are, are preferring, such as shared offices. Uh, we're also looking at conference facilities. In terms of education and research, um, really viewing the East Campus as, as the potential for, uh, site for an educational hub that offers security related programs and, and certificates uh, and that is, is DC focused but also could perhaps link uh, to regional programs through some sort of a university consortium. We're also thinking about this programmatically in terms of the STEM education that, that happens um, in the district and how we can better link local schools and students to, um, to the DHS economy so that we can begin to prepare students for those types of careers. And that ties into the workforce development and really trying to um, develop a pipeline of employment choices for local residents, uh, looking at uh, employment programs, wraparound services, um, a training academy. Well, so this is both kind of programmatic and, and, and planning based. And then lastly, the real estate and support infrastructure strategies. I, I mentioned um, housing. We're also looking at um, the range of transportation choices that could really support a vibrant uh, mixed-use campus 
and also the, the technology infrastructure that's needed and, and we're also looking into some sustainable energy utility options. So um, we're doing a lot, we're kind of in the trenches right now of doing analysis and planning. Um, and we're also trying to think about some pilot projects so that we don't necessarily um, have to wait, you know, a few years before we see anything happen on, on the East Campus. So as part of all this, um, there are some kind of, there are, there are three kind of key principles that we're also applying, which is to leverage partnerships that you, it would be impossible to develop any type of innovation hub without some fairly um, robust partnerships with the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Also integrating the planning, and I mentioned how we're bringing together the transportation, the infrastructure, the physical, and the economic development planning, and really applying all of that to um, the East Campus redevelopment. And then at the kind of a very fundamental level, making sure that throughout this we're promoting community-based economic development and really making those links between the neighborhood and um, uh, the consolidation of DHS. So that's, um, that was it on the DC Innovation Strategy. This is the contact information um, for all of us, and I think it goes back to uh, Shannon now. Great. Thank you so much, Justina and um, Harry and Scott, for those wonderful presentations. Right now we're going to uh, transition to Q&A, and uh, we just have a few questions right now. Um, so I encourage you all to open up the Q&A box on your GoToWebinar control panel and ask a few more questions. Um, the first question comes from uh, in Indranil Kumar, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, the question is for Scott, and it goes back to one of your earlier slides uh, of a cluster map. Uh, the question is, how did you find those connections between the industries and the Pennsylvania SNAC cluster? Okay, um, uh, good question. It's a, um, uh, it's a method that I've been working on um, for, the, uh, for the past couple of months, and basically um, uh, the simple answer is that you take the input-output table and run it through social network analysis software, um, and uh, that gives you all the linkages. Um, but if you if you are familiar with the uh, input-output table, that shows you the, the transactions um, from one industry to another industry, uh, and it is set up uh, as a square matrix, um, which is uh, exactly the type of matrix that a, that a social network uses. So that's the way you do it. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I have a question for um, Terry and Sakina. Terry, you touched a little bit on sort of the geographic issue um, wherein, you know, according to the feds, these are supposed to be regional innovation clusters. But in reality, um, you know, we don't really see things happen, you know, this kind of economic agglomeration happening so much at, you know, what we would consider in the Washington, D.C. region to be our region, including Maryland, the District of Columbia, and Virginia, but we see that it happening more in corridors. We see um, the Homeland Security Cluster emerging in Arlington and the district looking to do, do something similar at, in the in Ward 8, um, you know, we have a kind of biotech cluster on one uh, highway corridor. We have another kind of high-tech cluster in Tyson's Corner. Um, these are, in fact, kind of tend to be much more localized, and uh, the local economic development agencies, as you know, are somewhat competitive with each other historically and um, want to kind of keep their assets there and not necessarily promote um, you know, co collaboration, cooperation, uh, and looking at trying to connect these assets if, they, if that even can be done on, on a larger regional scale, like what the feds want to see. Do, you, do either of you have thoughts on, um, you know, how to address things that, um, you know, is there truly such a thing as a regional, quote unquote, uh, cluster, uh, or, you know, and do you think maybe some of these initiatives 
efforts by the feds will get the local jurisdictions to cooperate more uh, than they have in the past. I'll start off <coughs> with an answer, and that is um, this is the hardest place in the country, I think, to do that, um, partly because we've got the district and two states that have very robust economic development offices at the state level, effectively. And then probably the strongest group of city, county um, economic development agencies, I think, anywhere. So, <coughs> excuse me. The idea that that we are um, inherently competitive <coughs> and would have something to gain by cooperating has historically not uh, found any traction. Um, I think we hope that if there is some development of uh, of some trust and some uh, agreements that uh, uh, we will we will uh, abide by some kind of protocols relative to location, then we can get to the business of regional cooperation. Um, we clearly are not there yet. For instance, the, the, some of the major assets that the district hopes to consolidate um, at the St. E's site are major assets in Arlington. Um, Arlington does not want to lose those and will fight very hard to keep them. So as long as you have uh, this sense that, that you have to move it around, um, I think cooperation is going to be next to impossible. If you have an agreement as to what everybody's role and niche might be and you don't have to move very much stuff around, then I think there may be a basis for cooperation. Sakina, did you have anything to add? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, yeah, just to add a few words. I mean, yeah, I, I think that um, it's certainly a challenge to, to, to regionally cooperate in this area because we have um, you know, small geographic areas that, that are split up um, into various jurisdictions. But I think probably the Homeland Security Cluster offers um, one of um, one of those opportunities to promote regional coordination, particularly if we can identify, you know, what are those shared interests and, and shared outcomes um, that regional entities have. I think I think this could be maybe in some ways a kind of a pilot for, for better regional um, cooperation. And there is a lot of regional cooperation already around transportation and other things, but less so around um, economic development clusters. And as as the questioner pointed out, you know, there's been some very localized um, clusters developing that don't really cross um, jurisdictional boundaries. I think one of the things that's particularly interested, interesting about um, the Homeland Security economy and one of the reasons why uh, we received a, a federal grant to look at this is because there are still areas within the region that, that are very distressed, not just within the district but also um, within Maryland and, and Virginia. And to the extent that we can really use this um, or leverage this cluster in a way that promotes economic development and a more kind of equitable um, economic landscape across the region. I think that's probably a good thing and I think we can probably get some regional consensus around doing that. Shannon, I, I have a comment um, to add. Uh, yeah, I just recently completed a cluster study of the nuclear component manufacturing cluster in Pennsylvania. and. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, that cluster extends into New Jersey and Ohio. Um, uh, it's a very linear cluster um, centered around uh, Pittsburgh where um, Westinghouse is located. Uh, Westinghouse has about 60% market share in nuclear uh, technology. Um, I think one of the keys is to get private sector leadership um, and institutional leadership that uh, is not really focused on, on uh, uh, competitive um, competitive places. Uh, get that leadership into the cluster so that the, uh, the kinds of economic development um, uh, competition that we have between, say, Maryland and, and Virginia um, is really lessened because you have actors that at the table that are really um, want to see the whole thing function as a cluster. And in the case of the nuclear cluster, um, Westinghouse was saying, you know, 
we don't want you to stop at the Pennsylvania borders. We want to include New Jersey and Ohio because that's our supply chain. Mm -hmm. Maybe well, there's kind of a follow-on question to this, Scott. I think you'll probably be able to answer, and that's uh, it's from Michael Houston. He, he asks us to please discuss new cluster creation in non-federal areas of growth. Just, you know, bioscience, medicine, digital media, et cetera. What are some kind of principles for looking at how to grow new and emerging industries in your region? Uh, good question. Um, uh, the, I think the first thing is to not try to start something from scratch. And I know Terry um, talked about starting a, a Homeland Security uh, cluster from scratch. I think that was a unique situation because um, you know, Homeland Security is really only a decade old. Um, and you can argue that other things factored into that, but, um, but it really was a, a brand new industry. You have to start with what you're strong in. Um, so look at your, at your region uh, and find the pieces that make a, a cluster and then start to build it. Um, uh, I can tell you that um, other places, Kansas is doing a great job. Um, check out the report that was on the on the, my presentation. Uh, Purdue University, um, Ed Morrison do a lot of stuff with with cluster activation, um, uh, and he's got a lot of good examples up. So those are a couple ideas. And if I could just add, um, this is Sakina from the district, we actually just completed um, a study about the district's creative economy or creative cluster. And um, you know, going back to what Scott was just saying, we'd, we'd, we found that we actually have a very robust uh, creative base here, so we're not, we're not starting from scratch. Um, and it's something that we can really build on. Uh, if folks are interested in seeing that report, it's on the DC Office of Planning's website. As, as part of that report, we've, we've developed a whole set of actions uh, which are currently underway in terms of being implemented by an array of, of private, nonprofit, and public stakeholders. Great. Um, this next question is for you, Sakina. Regarding the innovation strategy drivers that you presented of business development, workforce development, education and research, and real estate and support infrastructure, which is the most important, and how would you rank them? Hmm. I, I don't think you can really rank them. I think if you're going to do a holistic or comprehensive approach to economic development, uh, particularly in an area that is, that is an emerging neighborhood, you really have to tackle all. I mean, we have to tackle the real estate and support infrastructure because we're dealing um, you know, with a physical context that needs uh, the infrastructure investment, the planning. There's actually no zoning currently on the East Campus, so um, there are some, some fundamental things we have to do from a kind of planning and physical redevelopment and real estate perspective. Um, and then on the econ you know, more on the economic development side, um, business development, workforce development, education and research, I mean, those are all interrelated and we really have to, to tackle them all. So. I, I don't think I'd be able to, to rank them, actually. OK. Uh, several of you have written in to ask uh, about software and methodology for analyzing your clusters. Uh, again, Indranel Kumar asks, is it possible to know which software was used for the input output table for Pennsylvania? or a, the Pennsylvania example you showed, Scott, and Ann Schnell asks, do any of those speakers have a resource for comparing software for cluster analysis, location quotient, input, output, et cetera? Uh, I'll let you answer that, Scott, but first I just wanted to mention there's a very good practitioner-oriented article on how you identify clusters step-by-step, step. Uh, again, by Heike Meyer, the Virginia Tech professor that was mentioned that uh, has been working on this study at St. East for the District of Columbia and did some of the Homeland Security cluster analysis uh, in Arlington County, and it's called Cluster Monitor. Um, you, should, you may be able to find it just by Googling those words, but if not, uh, get in touch with the, the division. Um, tweet us or email us, and uh, I'll respond and give you the reference if you're very interested in a methodology and um, 
God, I don't know what other resources. You don't really need a software. You can pull these yeah. things and do an Excel study pretty simply. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and that actually remind me, I, <clears throat> I feel bad now because I, in my timeline, I, uh, which I did this morning, I just drew in on uh, you know, prominent authors that I could think of right off the top of my head. And, and uh, uh, as soon as Terry mentioned Heike, I, I knew I should have had her on there. Um, yeah, a lot of the cluster analysis you can just do in Excel. I think if you're looking to do the, um, uh, the network diagrams, um, like I had on the, on the slides, the software is called NetDraw. Um, which is a free program. You can download it from Analytic Technologies. Um, and I'm, I really don't know of any you know, software out there specifically uh, for cluster analysis. Um, the, the methods associated with the, uh, the images that I showed, I'm going to be writing up in the next um, uh, two months or so, and uh, and putting that out for publication. So um, if anybody's interested, email me. I'll make sure you get a copy um, as soon as that's written up. Great. Um, yeah, and I think you know we should mention that, and Dr. Meyer talks about this in the cluster monitor paper that um, you know there's a quantitative element towards analyzing and kind of trying to identify, you know, clusters in your region. But then there should also be a qualitative follow-up similar to, to what Sakina and Terry were talking about, the role of the, you know, economic development planner as being the one that is convening. Um, you have to, you know, interviewing, not just relying on the data alone because you'll find different kinds of connections and oftentimes you'll find uh, kind of new emerging industries that you know are not captured again in those um, in those uh, industry codes that are currently established. I don't know, Terry, if you wanted to add on to that a little bit more about what how Arlington's gone about the qualitative side of cluster analysis. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think part of it is is getting to know who who the people are. Um, when Scott talked about the, the networks, well, networks aren't businesses necessarily, they're people. And so um, you have to know the people, you have to know the companies, um, and you kind of have to know where the companies fit in. We, we do a lot of introducing people to each other. Um, and to, to our surprise, when we started doing this probably about a decade ago, we were by holding small luncheons for, for corporate executives, uh, for presuming that since they worked in the same industries, they all knew each other, and we found out that very seldom did they know each other at all. And so the uh, ability to put people together and try to figure out how we as an economic development agency can add value to the businesses and to the individuals has been a large part of, of our, I think, our success. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um I think that's it. We don't have any other questions. I will add that we did have one uh, participant who just sent in a link to a free cluster analysis software that I'm sending out to everyone right now uh, via the question frame. Um, well, I think, I think that about wraps us up. We can close a few minutes early. And uh, I just wanted to thank you again, Sakina. Terry and Scott for this great presentation. I think it's been um, hopefully very enlightening for many. And uh, I appreciate the audience participation that we've had today as well. And again, encourage all of you um, that are interested to get involved with the Economic Development Division. Uh, we have many, many roles you can play. Um, so again, please feel free to tweet us, uh, contact us via our blog or online at our planning.org website under divisions. And with that, uh, Cody, I'll give it back to you to wrap up. Thanks, Shanna. Um, yeah, for those of you still in attendance, I just want to go over logging SAM credits again. So as I said earlier, this is already approved. So um, after you log out of here, you can go to www.planning.org slash SAM, select activities by date, and then underneath Friday, June 17th, you'll see planning for regional innovation clusters. Also. 
Um, like I said as well, we are recording today's session, so you'll be able to find a PDF and video recording of today's webinar at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast dash archive, and this should be up by Monday. So with that, I just want to, again, thank everyone um, with your participation, and this concludes our webinar for today. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.